Okay. Good day, everyone. Um, we have an interesting session on the basics of arthroscopy, both the knee and the shoulder. This day is going to be a very interesting and uh, a, a session that is going to be very close to my heart because uh, we have uh, faculty from the JIPMA alumni group. We have uh, Professor Patro who will be joining us soon. He was head of orthopedics and currently is professor of orthopedics and Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences. We have Dr. Jagdish Menon, previous head of orthopedics in JIPMA. And Dr. Deepan Menon, he is consultant orthopedic surgeon at Kettering General Hospital, Leicester, UK. And Dr. Pandey, he is consultant orthopedic in shoulder and elbow unit, Leicester General Hospital, UK. Our speaker is going to be Dr. Hari Krishna, this consultant orthopedic and arthroscopic surgeon from Hubli, Nataka, and myself, Dr. Dr. Srinivas Kamambati from Vijayawada. Welcome all. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to make the presentation and also chair the pro program. Thank you very much. And we welcome all of you to the program. Dr. Hari Krishna. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And the topic which we are going to discuss today is a very basic topic and which is going to be useful for general orthopedic surgeons also. And as a basic orthoscopic surgeons, see, as we feel to uh, start doing the scopic surgeries, we'll be going on on depth of ACL, PCL and all these surgeries, but the basic knowledge is very important. And uh, today we are going to solve all the issues about that. I thank Dr. Sesinder for giving an opportunity to me. So share screen. Yeah, please. Shashi, Professor Patro has joined. Is on. Shashi, yeah. post disabled we have Professor Patro. We have Professor yeah. Patro. He was uh, previously Please. head of Department of Orthopedics, JIPMA, and currently Professor of uh, Orthopedics at Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences. Welcome, sir. Hello. Thank Hi. you very much for accepting to moderate the session. Thank uh, you. We are live and we are going ahead with the presentations. Please. Krishna, please go ahead. So host disabled participant screening sharing is coming or not? Actually, it is on. Hari, are you able to share your screen? No, post disabled participant screen sharing. No, just a second. Uh... <laughs> Dr. Srinivas, I am somehow I'm not able to get that option. I'm going to make you host. Okay. You're the host, no, Dr. Srinivas. Okay. Yeah. And you can. Can you do now, Hari? Yeah. 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 Good evening, everyone. So the endoscopic surgery, the it's a surgical philosophy which we do with less invasive techniques like minimal keyhole surgeries. So the arthroscopy is the keyhole surgery which we do in the joints. So the arthroscopy is a surgical philosophy that emphasizes on minimum invasion, enhanced imaging, and microsurgical manipulation of the tissues. So it's an evolution which goes on in any field. So in orthopedics especially, the evolution of arthroscopy has started way beyond in, eight, in 1900s also. So the, as we are surgeons, we have always been ready to adapt the advances in the technology into our practices. So the advantages of the arthroscopic surgery, sir, it's a keyhole technique, better visualization, and the di uh, accurate diagnosis. And because of the minimal keyhole surgeries, it is less painful and with a small scar and a very low complication rate and it usually a daycare procedures. So it's why it's a difficult uh, technique to learn because it looks elsewhere towards the monitor and then we operate in the joints. So it's a difficult technique to learn for normal orthopedic surgeons. So way beyond Professor Kenji Takai in Tokyo, has traditionally credited with performing the first arthroscopic examination of the knee joint in 1919 with 7.3 mm cystoscope. 
So, but the main credit goes to Dr. Masaki Vatna from the Japan in 1950. So he devised the first functional arthroscope number 21 Vatna arthroscope, where he first performed the therapeutic, like first arthroscopic menisectomy in 1962. So what basical instruments, what equipments we need in arthroscopy. So if you see, there is a camera, there is an arthroscope with inlet and outlet tab, and there is a light source and the power, the camera is connected to the TV monitor and the irrigation fluid, which we use to see in the joints because of the bleeding. So we continue uh, to use a saline irrigation to see the joints. So there is a monitor. The monitor is a device which connects the image to the, from the arthroscope and there's a camera. And usually the camera has an option of zooming and taking the pictures and the light source is connected to the arthroscope. So main comes, what is an arthroscope? The professor Harold Hopkins, which we used a rigid lens system uh, for the joints, especially if you want to operate in the joints, we need a rigid lens system and a rigid arthroscope to perform in the joints, where he has a main credit of uh, inventing the rod lens system, which he has used in the normal arthroscopes. And uh, he has invented a, uh, so many inventions on his name. So an arthroscope is an optical instrument where three basic optical instrument uh, systems have been used in rigid arthroscopes. So the arthroscope has the classic thin optical lens system and the Hopkins rod lens system. So the conventional one has doesn't have a Hopkins rod lens system. Once he started using the glass in the uh, optical lens system, the picture image quality has become better and we can be able to use the light source, which is a cold light source. So the certain features determine the optical characters of an arthroscope. So the most important are the diameter. There are different variations of the diameters of the rigid arthroscopes and the angle of inclination and the field of view. So there are different types of arthroscopes. Uh, like according to the degrees, there is 25 degree, 30 degree, 0 degree, 7, uh, 70 degree, 90 degree, which we routinely use is a 30 degree arthroscope in, uh, uh, in orthopedic practices. Sometimes we use 70 degrees while we are operating in hip as well as in shoulder while we are doing a subscapular repair or sometimes in a posterior compartment to see with the 70 degrees if you are repairing a ramp lesion. So there are 1.9 mm scope has, see the field of view refers to the viewing angle encompassed by the lens and varies according to the types of arthroscopes. So starting has 1.9 mm scope has 65 degree of view. So what we use usually is a 4 mm scope which has 115 degree of view. So the wider viewing angles makes more orientation and it will be easier to see. Hello. We can hear you now. Go ahead. It's not moving. Slide is not moving. Hari, we can hear you. You can go ahead. The slide is not moving forward. That must be a computer issue. I'll stop sharing option. Again, I'll share screen. It's not moving. Yeah. So if you see with a zero degree scope, we have a, this much of view. If you see with a 30 degree scope, where we have, we can use with the different variations, we can increase the field of view, view from the 30 degree scope. So by rotating the 30 degree scope, we can increase the angle of inclination and we can have a more effect on the image of the picture which we see in the joints. So the 70 degree arthroscope is which we commonly used has some effect on the joints where it has a blind spot. So if, so if you use a 70 degree arthroscope, what happens? So there is a study which was done uh, by A. Sinha and Monga that if we use a 70 degree arthroscope, there is a blind spot. 
So what they have done is they 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 compared with the 30 degree arthroscope and a 70 degree arthroscope. So they made with the conclusion that a significant blind spot directly in front of the scope, at uh, from which it is at at least 4.4 centimeter distance from, if you view from the 5 centimeter distance from the scope, there is a blind spot clearly seen in front of the 70 degree arthroscope. So if you use a 30 degree arthroscope, the blind spot coming is very less, so we can have a better visualization. Of the field, so that is why the 30 degree arthroscope is most commonly used uh, scope by general orthopedic surgeons and arthroscopic surgeons. So one more study which was uh, evaluated uh, for the uh, different types of arthroscope and what is the distortion of the images if you use 30 degree, 45 degree, 70 degree arthroscopes. So this study uh, which was uh, presented in annual meeting uh, by Hoshino et al. They evaluated arthroscopic image distortion with different types of scopes so they they kept 30 degree scope from the medial portal and 30 degree scope from the anterolateral portal and 70 degree scope from the medial portal and 70 degree scope from the anterolateral portal so what they made conclusion is that when we use a 30 degree scope so there is a least distortion of the arthroscopic image which we see so that's why it is also one of the commonest reason why we use arthroscope of 30 degree scope. So they made a uh, picturization in the distal femur, which is a deep and shallow, and they analyzed with this. So with, if you use a 30 degree scope from the medial portal and 30 degree scope from the lateral portal, and they made 70 degree scope from the medial portal and 70 degree scope from the lateral portal, they made a conclusion that from the medial portal, definitely 70 degree scope, we have a better visualization for the uh, ACL footprint or PCL footprints. But with the 70 degree arthroscope, if you see in a lateral portal, there is having more distortion. And for the deep, if you want to see the uh, deeper area of the femur or from the ASL footprint, it will be very difficult with the 70 degree arthroscopes. So they made a conclusion that 30 degrees is a better scope for the ACL footprint visualization compared to the 70 degree uh, footprint. So that if you use from the lateral portal, because we usually use from the anterolateral portal. So while drilling from the medial portal to the femoral footprint, better visualization will be better with the 30 degree scope than with the 70 degree scope. Then there is any role with the 45 degree arthroscopes. Yeah, there's a good paper which come up. What they tell is 45 degree arthroscopes have very good view. So uh, there's a video which shows that, that if I see a 30 degree arthroscope, I cannot see the ACL footprint clearly from the anterolateral portal because the, the ACL footprint is almost deeper part of the lateral femoral content. But if I use a, but I can able to see the PCL fibers, but I can able to see the middle meniscus. But with the 30 degree scope, the ACL footprint visualization is a little bit, not much better than with the 45 degree arthroscope. So there is a video which shows with the 45 degree arthroscope. Here, we can able to visualize a little bit better than the 30 degree arthroscope, the ACL footprint. And we can see the markings easily. See, while we are drilling, we should see for the ACL footprint, we should see the how much we are drilling. So we can see the marking easily with the 45 degree arthroscope than with the 30, 30 degree arthroscope from the anterolateral portal. And with the 70 degree scope also they have kept inside. And we can see the more deeper area with the 70 degree arthroscope and we can see all areas very easily like middle meniscus, femoral condyle and the PCL fibers. But with the 70 degree scope, we can see more depth so there is very uh, high chances of uh, getting variation and uh, chances of not getting perfect footprint with 70 degree arthroscope. The same, which, which these images shows that if you use with 30 degree scope, we can see on the both sides. If you see a 45 degree arthroscope, we can see up to here. But if we see a 70 degree arthroscope, we can see up to depth of this much. So same, the images with arthroscopic images, which shows with the 30 degree arthroscope, this is ACL footprint with a 45 degree arthroscope and with a 70 degree arthroscope we are able to see but we can able to see the depth better than the deeper part of the femoral condyle. So according to him that 45 degree has a better view of the footprint of the ACL than compared to the 30 degree and 70 degree arthroscopes. So uh, if I want to use the scope then how I should keep in my hand. So I should have some trocar or sheath for, to, to keep my scope in scope so there is so with the scope holding there is a locking mechanism which has the trocar and the sheath 
and there is an inlet and outlet where for the inlet we want to have a saline irrigation pump and there is a trocar to pierce into the joint after putting a 11 number knife we want to go into the joint the trocar which aids which is into the soft tissue into the joint so it is has a blunt trocar and the uh, trocar tape with a sharp trocar so usually there will be sharp trocar will be better for the joints so what anesthesia usually we prefer while doing arthroscopies so in india we usually use a spinal anesthesia most commonly for the knee joints and for the shoulder joints we usually use an interscalene block with uh, general anesthesia but there is uh, but usually we combine uh, epinephrine with uh, lignocaine or i use saline with epinephrine for the better visualization of the joints especially in the shoulder but there are some tells the some saying that epinephrine and lidocaine combination can have chondrotoxicity this i want to discuss later on with the panelists what are the which prefer in different areas so which irrigation solution is preferred for the arthroscopies so we generally use a normal saline but everywhere which i was going through the literature that it tells that the ringer lactate is a better solution uh, for the arthroscopies as it is almost physiological to the body and uh, which has minimal synovial damage and articular surface changes uh, so but uh, maybe the cost factor uh, which is uh, important uh, if we, because usually we take more saline bottles in shoulders than in the knee joints so i feel that may be the reason where but actually the ringer lactate is one of the best solution uh, which you to be used in the joint and while we using the saline stands uh, we usually use from the base of the operating table 3 to 4 feet high so it produces at least 66 to 88 millimeters of pressure so that we can able to see clearly uh, by the saline inflow sometimes we can add the epinephrine to see the bet, uh, better visual uh, visual bit of the joints especially in the shoulders so pumps uh, regular using of pumps is most commonly used in the shoulder joints but not much in the knee joints so if i am using a pump how much pressure i should keep in the pump so it it varies with the joints and usual pressure is the 60 mm of mercury so more than 120 mm of mercury causes capsular damage and the articular damage so it should not increase more than 120 mm of mercury so the vision and hemostasis will be better approximately 30 mm below the systolic blood pressure so if the systolic blood pressure is 100 so better to have the pump pressure on 60 to 70 mm of mercury so that because usually in shoulder anesthesia we give a hypotensive anesthesia so better to have if, if the systolic is 100 then better to have at 60 to 70 will be a better visualization of the field but usually in the elbow and ankles we, should, we cannot give that much pressure because of most problem of the extravasation of the fluid because it is smaller joints so we used to keep Uh, the the recommendation is 40 to 60 mm of mercury in the elbow and the ankle joints and the shaver which is a uh, very important instrument in arthroscopy is where uh, we can use for the debridements of the joints uh, debridement of the asl footprints and the debridement of the synovial tissues uh, this, uh, so they have uh, the shaver system has the hand piece and the blades so they are the outer hollow sheet, there will be outer hollow sheet with an inner sheet where the it, it sucks the uh, it after cutting it sucks the damaged which will remove the tissues from the suction outlet so what is the revolution per minute which we used to keep uh, for the soft tissue cutting so the rpm is uh, for the soft cutting soft tissue it is 1200 to 2000 rpm if you are using a burr so when we are using a burr for the acromioplasty or if you are using for any uh calcifications or osteophytes we can use the burr so we can keep at 2000 to 4000 rpm and usually the hand pieces uh, is autoclavable and the shoulder pl blades are disposable this is a burr which we use for the acromioplasty this is an acromium and usually the burrs comes in 4 mm so i feel the burr is has a calculation we can use for the calculation of the how much of acromion i am removing in acromioplasty so this is a 4 mm means i am able to remove the 4 mm of acromion i can see the depth of the burr also i can see the length of the burr also so that how much acromion i am able to remove in subacromion decompression so we can measure with that uh, depending upon the burrs but usually we use 4 mm to 3.5 to 4.5 mm burrs and rf which is most commonly used nowadays uh, because of the advances in the different uh, joints the electro cautery which we use previously was a if we want to use a normal cautery we use a glycerol solution 
but now with the rf we can use with the normal saline and R, uh, with the ringer lactate also so how the rf one of the example which we use the uh, i want this is a case where i used an rf for removing an uh, long head of biceps so this is an rf probe this is a long head of biceps stenotomy i am doing uh, in a case of rotator cuff tear so these probes rf will be useful to remove the long head of biceps very easily with not much damage to the humeral head and uh, we can use rf in different different areas for the synovectomy also so this is an rf which i am using for the long head of biceps stenotum in the shoulder joint so coming to the leg holders which we use because some people use leg uh, holder and leg, leg hanging also but i usually prefer keeping a post on the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh because uh, to see the anterior medial compartment of the uh, knee joint on uh, the posterior medial compartment of the knee joint it will be better uh, if you keep a post on the lateral side so that we can see the medial meniscus very easily if i am planning a meniscus repair i can able to see better the knee joint after pike resting the mcl but i usually keep a leg holder on my lateral side if i am using for the acl reconstruction also i can flex the knee joint so that one more person is not needed if you have a leg support so this is one of the use for the arthroscopic knee joints and very important the pro which is called uh, extension of surgeon's finger which is very very important for the arthroscopist like it is an extension of the finger and one important thing in the pro is it has a hook and it has calibrations so what calibrations are important yes it's very important to see the uh, glenoid bone loss in shoulders arthroscopies if you want to perform if you want to change from bankard to the latajet and if you in a, if you were planning for the meniscal repair i cannot go deep the meniscus divides into the posterior and i cannot damage the neurovascular structures so there we can use uh, this probing this calculation of the markings that it is 1 mm depth so that i can see okay this is 1 cm depth i cannot go more than that for the meniscal repairs so it has so many advantages you can I, as a shoulder surgeon i can just remove the suture retriever also i can use the shoulder retriever also we can remove the loose bodies there are so many advantages with the hook and probe and i can use uh, for the acl laxity or uh, we can use for the uh, uh, probing the meniscus tear it has so many advantages that it is an extension of the uh, surgeon's hands in especially in arthroscopy and coming to the basket forceps there are so many punches we use for the arthroscopy there is an up up, up punches lower punches usually we use for the meniscectomies which is common and removing of any soft tissue synovial tissue for the biopsies in any tumors also uh, there are so many different types of punches available in the market uh, one more thing is the gasping forceps this is very important i usually call it soft tissue grasper it's called as anything it's like a grasper which we can use for the meniscal fragments to remove after a synovectomy or the meniscectomy uh, if you want to remove the osteophytes for the removal of synovial biopsy i use the soft tissue grasper these are called grasping forceps this see these all instruments are usually in the 4 mm to uh, 3.5 mm to 4.5 mm in, in diameter so that we can easily pass through the cannulas also this i'll come later on i'll ask the panelists that how they sterilize their own instruments so coming to this very important topic as an arthroscopic surgeon as a basic orthopedic surgeon so what is a triangulation skill so if i am uh, planning an arthroscopy in the joint so i should know after inserting the scope in uh, trocar into the joint i should know where the opposite instrument is coming so that makes a triangle that opposite instruments coming into the joint so there is a very interesting paper which comes uh, which with vasin and atal uh, what they used is they made this is a camera with the trocar and the opposite instrument so according to them that they tells that at least there should be 2 mm distance from the scope to the shaver tip distance so they calculated the scope to the shaver distance so the, according to them if you want if you don't want to damage the opposite instruments see i mean i don't everybody knows that we damage more of the scopes because of the shaver systems so according to them that uh, at least there should be a 2 mm distance from the scope tip distance so the scope tip which has a glass 
uh, we, uh, from the opposite shaver system, there is very, very high chance of damaging the lens. So they tell us that at least there should be a 2 mm distance from the scope lens to the opposite shaver system so that we can have a very less chances of damaging the scope. So this is one good paper which I've thought to be shared with you. And this is very important for the starting surgeons like ACL and PCL set. So what comprises of the ACL PCL set? So if I'm planning an arthroscopic ACL reconstruction, I use probe, I use reamers, I use tendon strippers, I use sizes and go on. So I want to talk more on strippers because there are two types of strippers which we use for the tendon stripping for the any graft. So this is an excellent video which demonstrates that this is a closed stripper means there is no open end on the distal side. And for the closed stripper, the tendon to be stripped from the distal end so that it will be tied to the ethypondar fiber wire. And I can use a closed stripper to remove the tendons. This is a gracilis or hamstring tendon. So this is a closed stripper. If you want to use a closed stripper, there should be a distal end will be removed and it should be tied with some of the sutures so that it will not be prematurely amputated. And this is one more stripper, which is an open stripper. Here, we remove the bands, uh, extra bands, which are for the, uh, for the gracilis tendon. Here, here, the distal stump of the gracilis tendon is not removed. So here, we can, we can use an open stripper. So if I have open slot only, I can pass through the tendon and I can go up to the distal part, uh, proximal part of the tendon, I can remove it. So this is an open slot. There is an open here. And I'm passing through the gracilis. But I, I prefer closed one because I have, I, I felt there's a very, very high chances of amputating if you use open stripper. It depends upon different surgeons. But I prefer a closed stripper so that there is very less chance of premature amputation of the grafts. And this is a graft board. If uh, so, usually we see after taking the graft, there is a calibrations on the board and uh, there is a markings where after that, how much of graft to be inside the tunnel how much to be in the femoral bo bone surface and how and uh, tying of at the bond along with the endo button along with the tensioner so there is there are so many users with the graft board which is to be known by everybody so that it's easy while you are operating the surgeries so coming to the implants which we use for the arthroscopy uh, for the knee joints especially there is an endo button uh, there is a screw in the, in the screws there are uh, soft screws and metal screws so in the endo button has a different calibrations. It starts from uh, 10 mm, 12 mm, 14 mm, like different up to, it goes up to 30 to 40 mm. So that there is a fiber, there is a loop, which this is the loop which tells the mm how much of the endo button is. It's 10 mm, 12 mm or 15 mm. There is endo button, which is used for the arthroscopic ACL reconstruction or basal reconstructions for the grafts. So uh, why uh, the most commonly used are the metal implants, which previously we used to use the metal anchors and the metal screws. So definitely the metal anchors, I prefer to be used in uh, revision cases as well as for the osteoporotics, uh, for the osteoporotic shoulders, better to have a metal anchors because they have uh, excellent strength and fixation for part. So, uh, but they have some complications. If you uh, keep in the joint, sometimes they dislodge from the shoulder joint, chances of more irritation compared to the bioabsorbable screws. So, and sometimes if you are planning any revisions, definitely these metals will come in as an artifact while you are having an MRI scan. So there is different types of uh, screws. This is uh, with hydroxy coated PLLA bioabsorbable screws and PLLA usually doesn't decompose early. It, it, it takes long time. Uh, with hydroxy apatite, it de degrades as early as possible. So this is an uh, ASL arthroscopic surgery where I'm using uh, bio screw, this is HA coated, and this is a graft stump with an ethy bond. And this is a screwdriver. To, to pass a screw, there sh we should use a bead pin so that we can pass the screw inferior to the graft here. So there is different types of uh, screws which are available. Some uses uh, only washer on the distal end, bio screws, there is hybrid techniques which they use a bio screw as well as the washer at the distal end of the tibia. And there's an endo button here. And this is a screw in the ACL with the endo button. And we can use distally different types of screws as well. 
So coming to the meniscus repair, where uh, this is a very important topic and which is evolving more in knee joints that uh, what are the main instruments which you use for the meniscal repair that if I want to use in the knee joint that for the meniscal repair, I use a scorpion mini for the, if I want to take uh, for the root tears, if I want to repair the posterior horn of the middle meniscus, I take a device like fast fix, like all inside. And these are the uh, aimers for the posterior portals, which I want to ream. And there are spinal needles also, which will be useful. So there are different techniques of meniscus repair. If I want to repair with, I get these different types of specific, zone specific cannulas are available, which we can use for the outer, middle and the posterior horns of the meniscus. So there are different companies which we, this is all inside repairs, which, which most commonly uses the fast fix device. And now more devices have come. So this is one more technique where there is a spinal needle and one more spinal needle. And there is a, we can use a PDS or any nylon sutures so that we can retrieve the suture from here so that we can be able to repair the meniscus. So this is out and inside technique. And this is also, we can use that. So this is a uh, case where uh, I'm using a fast fix like a convert device where we can use, this is a posterior horn repair. So if I am planning for a bucket handle repair, I take posterior horn with the fast fix for the all inset technique and the middle and the anterior horn with the spinal needles because it cut shorts the cost factor as well as uh, we can able to repair the anterior and middle horn with outside inset technique only. And for the posterior only, we can use the all inset technique. So coming to the shoulder arthroscopy. The shoulder arthroscopy is a very difficult uh, for the new uh, surgeons, but it's once you learn, it's very, very easy. So there is uh, different types of positions which use for the shoulder arthroscopy, like lateral decupitus position and the beach chair position. We usually, I usually prefer a uh, lateral decupitus position. This is a stand. Uh, which has a hand uh, support and there is a lateral traction and we can give a traction here. So one thing which should be important while using a lateral decubitus position, if you're using for the bank cut repair, if you are using the abduction uh, support, there's very, very high chances of injuring the brachial flexes. So you should not have a prolonged abduction traction while using a shoulder traction in mainly the abduction one. This is a hand fixator for the shoulder stand. So. As an armamentarium, I usually keep a pencil, that's marking pencil is very important for the shoulder arthroscopic surgeon because see after the surgery also still the portals uh, are remaining. Still, after the portal suturing also still my marking is there. I Means it's very, very important as a uh, starting arthroscopic or any shoulder surgeons because I want to see from where, which portal I'm coming in and I'm coming out. So I want to see the anterior superior portal or lateral portal, the posterior portal. So marking is very important. And one more thing is a spinal needle. I usually use a, everybody the common is the 18 gauze spinal needle where we can use to getting inside the joints. And coming to the instruments uh, for the shoulder, especially. So uh, there is a trocurrent cannula, which is commonly used uh, for the all orthoscopic surgeries. And uh, there is, this is a suture lasso. This has shaped hook for the abduction for the shoulder. Uh, bank cut repair and there's a hammer to uh, punch the anchors inside and the arteries the arteries has also means like a uh, mosquitoes also significant because after putting the anchor in the shoulder i want to keep the distal end of the sutures intact so that it will not come out so i can able to keep secure with the mosquito or the forceps or with the arteries so uh, this is a cannula this is a convent which was used for the lasso this is a lasso 45 degree left side and there is a probe, there is a probe, and this is a curate, which we use for the shoulder, curating the shoulder for the bank cut repair. There is a rasp also, which use, we usually use for the shoulder arthroscopy. The Wissinger rod, which I feel it's very important for the shoulder arthroscopic surgeon, because you want to come out from the lateral, from the posterior portal, from the lateral portal. I use, I want to switch from the lateral to the anterior portal, from the posterior to the anterior portal. I use a Wissinger rod so that I can exchange my, uh, my, trocar sheath to the plastic cannula and from the plastic cannula to the trocar sheath. So the messenger rod is very, very important for the shoulder arthroscopic surgeons. So the cannulas, uh, which we, uh, we use for the uh, shoulder arthroscopy, it starts from different diameters like 4 mm, 8 mm, 
6.5 mm like that but usually we i prefer means everybody prefers is 8 mm cannulas so that i can able to easily pass the suture retriever instruments scorpions anything so that should have a 8 mm diameter so it's very difficult because uh, what happens if you use 4.5 mm uh, cannulas on both sides i cannot able to pass the scorpion i cannot able to re retrieve the suture if i am using so better to have a 8 mm thicker cannulas so that i can able to retrieve the suture and i can able to uh, suture back the soft tissues so this is a different cannulas which we use and this is a suture manipulator which we use for the arthroscopies and not pusher and suture cutter so this is a scorpion device which used for the shoulder arthroscopies or for the meniscal repairs also this is an excellent video which demonstrates so this is a scorpion which i am using for the rotator cuff repair the scorpion after taking the thread through the scorpion once i take a bite through the cuff tissue the needle comes out the needle pops out so once the needle pops out only we can retrieve the suture and then we come out from the cannula and then suture it back the soft tissue so scorpion has very good advantage and the soft tissue uh, grasper which is retrieving the sutures so we can able to take the bites very easily uh for the rotator cuff sometimes uh, now i started using for the inferior banker tripper also fast fix mini like a scorpion device we can take for the inferior labrum also so bird beak it's very very important device so that if i don't have any armamentarium like scorpion or lasso i can just use bird beak to pass the suture from the soft tissue i can retrieve it back and i can uh, tie the sutures see this uh, this is a labrum Uh, this humeral head i am passing usually i have a labrum on the superior side the bird for bird beak is very useful if you want to suture on the uh, anterior superior side so the bird beak is passed and after the bird beak is passed the suture is retrieved from the bird beak and we can come out so that it is it cut shorts the time as well as the costly instruments like scorpion also but we cannot pass this instrument in the anterior inferior side where the actual labrum is there because the chance of breakage and chance of damage also to the tissue is more and it's very difficult to manipulate the tissues with this now this is a uh, video which demonstrates the uh, all parts of the shoulder arthroscopy where this is a uh, drill after using this drill this is a labrum this is a glenoid so once i drill the anterior glenoid aphis this is a suture material which is seen here so i remove the drill sleeve then once the sutures are there then i do i use a soft tissue grasper to retrieve the suture from the posterior portal then i start using the suture lasso see there is a sutures here and this is a labral tissue this is anti inferior inferior area and from the posterior portal i take my soft tissue grasper to retrieve the suture see so this is soft tissue grasper i am retrieving the sutures some people remove all sutures to the posterior side or one one suture and going on tying the anterior inferior labrum so after taking the suture back i use a suture lasso to take from the anterior inferior labrum area where we can get through from the posterior portal and retrieve it back and tie the sutures see this is a lasso of 45 degree the right can be used for the left shoulder and the left can be used for the right shoulder the lasso takes bite from the labrum the lasso is already loaded with the pds suture the pds comes out the pds comes out now i come from the posterior portal taking the suture back pds and take one of the sutures which is white one braided or a blue one so that i can tie it and get it back and start putting the knots so the suture lasso plays a very important role in uh, labral repair as well as for the cuff tissue also this is one of the important armamentarium for the shoulder arthroscopic surgeons so once i retrieve the sutures back one more point is there here where i use a suture knot pusher 
which is very important. Yeah. So uh, see, uh, the, it comes in not next slides also. The once the braided sutures are come out, we should able to see whether there is any slack or any knot already happened while you are retrieving the sutures. So that's what important while you are taking a compounded suture knot or a simple knot. So once so in this video, it's demonstrate that I pass my knot pusher up to here to see whether there is a knot here or not. Yeah, the knot pusher come and sees whether there is a knot here and then start uh, applying the suture, suture knots from the outside the portals from the cannulas. So there are different types of suture anchors which are available, uh, which we can use the metal anchors also, as well as the bio anchors also. There are different uh, disadvantages with the bio anchors where well because the de design of the anchors, there is some biological response. So there is some damage to the joints are very, some of often will be seen than with metal anchors also, the bio anchors. So what is knotless anchor? Which is which commonly we are using nowadays because it's easier technique so that once you pass the switches, go and put a drilling and putting the knots. So this is a video which demonstrates the knotless suture. So after tying the rotator cuff for the double row repair, once I cut the other threads, so I pass the threads through the slot which is given for the multifix device and go on pulling the threads and then bury this anchor into the anterior on the GT. So you, if you want to do a double row repair in the shoulder arthroscopy, better use this civil lock or multifix device so that once take these threads and bury on this, this is so that there will be one support here as well as the one more support on the lateral side on the GT. So once you tighten it, the switches goes inside. We usually use means sometimes for the bicep stenodesis also, we can use this civil log anchors. So coming to the last topic, which like arthroscopic knots, uh, because this is a very important topic for the shoulder arthroscopic surgeon, because it's not easy to take the sutures from the outside the body and go on inside and uh, tying the soft tissues. So the open is very easy, arthroscopic, it's a little bit difficult and uh, not substitute device already are there like knotless anchors. So what, what important topic we should know on knots is, there are two, two threads which we take from the anchor. One is called post limb and one is called wrapping limb. So once the wrapping limb is on the other side and one is the post limb. So usually the arthroscopic surgeries has most of compounding knots like modified Duncan knots or like stacked half hitches. So go on putting half hitches and then tie the knots or go on, uh, put a compounding knot so that three to four switches at the same time and go on uh, putting the knot. So this is a loop after you tie the knot and this is a knot. So why it's very important for a arthroscopic shoulder surgeons because the loop security as well as the knot security is also very important. So coming to the knot security, the three main factors which are important for the knot security is see, if you don't have a knot security, it comes out then there is very, very high chance of failure. So the knot security has main three important, that is friction, internal interference and slack between the throws. So how to avoid the friction? So if you use a monofilament sutures, there is very, very high chance of friction. So the braided sutures has more friction, uh, they withhold the friction. So we use a fiber wire or like braided sutures and how to avoid the more internal interference. So uh, once we, uh, Put, go on putting the overhand, 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 and we, we start it. So there is chances of internal interference and there is high chances of failure. So that what, how to decrease the internal interference chances by switching the post. See, once the loop can be switched to the post and post can be switched to the loop. So that we can decrease the chances of, that means we can increase the knot security and by reversing the half hitches. Means what are the half hitches? Once, one, one switcher overhand and one, one under, one under, one over one under, one over one under will make you better the knot security and the slack between the throws. This I already shown in the video that you should see whether there is any twist in the uh, thread which you are retrieved and by fast pointing with the 
so uh, not push so that the slack is not there in the knot so that once you make sure that this is clear then definitely there is a very very high chance so your knot is going to hold once you take the sutures so what are the different types of sutures which we will take so the coming to the loop security the loop security is also important because this is an image see once we put an anchor once we take the soft tissue to the anchor if there is a loop is loose so definitely there is chance of uh, failure is very very high because there is no the soft tissue is not grasping to the bone so once the bleeding bone surface is comes contact with soft tissue then only the healing starts so if there is no loop security it's very difficult so how to hold better loop security see is main ability to it's mainly to have tight sutures and better to have a tight approximation of the sutures to see whether in during arthroscopy that the tissue is approximated properly or not so what is uh, this uh, this is a loop and which is an under 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 this is over and over i'll come with a video so this is a duncan loop which is a compounding uh, uh, knot which is very very commonly used see this can be used without knot pusher also means there is one overhand second overhand throw third overhand throw fourth overhand throw and take the suture inside from the last thing and then start pulling so here i no need to use any knot pusher to hold this knot so just i pull the loop once it comes then take one more underneath it and one more these are all called half hitches how to take half hitches one over and under and see i am switching the post means i am switching the loop to the post and now i am taking red to the white means once you switch the post there is very very high chance of having more knot security so that it's very difficult to loosen the suture so one more knot which is not a compounding knot is a nicky knot where nicky knots is also one of the commonest to use so this is a loop so the, here we use almost 3 to 4 overhand throws then once you ret uh, retrieve the loop then go on putting the under half hitches see why so i want to tell very clearly that why the underhand and one why is the overhand so the half hitches plays a very important role because the chances of knot security depends upon how many half hitches you are taken under and reverse so there is a, so if you want to so this is a good uh, graph which shows that see the reverse half hitches if you take with this uh, smc knot roder knot western knot duncan knot so if you use a normal duncan knot if you use a reverse half hitches definitely the chance of failure is very less so the load to failure for the knot will be less with the duncan with the reverse half hitches because the knot security will be better than with the normal knots so the nicky knots with the normal without half hitches and the nicky knot with reverse half hitches has a better uh, load uh, can withhold more load and with, with, with more knot security so that's why adding more half hitches to your knots will become a better strength to the knot so that it holds more strength for the knot security same like loop loop circumference see i usually i usually do a nicky knots because see once i use a compounding knot so what is happened with the compounding knot once i put three or four once i push into the joint if there is any knot happens i cannot retrieve one one suture so if i put a simple sutures if there is a knot happened also i can retrieve with a probe so that's why taking a nicky knot which is like one two three overhands then taking one under and underhand will be better than taking a compounding loop but compounding loop is which is like a modified duncan loop which is commonly preferred by all orthopedic surgeons so this is the last video just that how to clean the shaver system so once the shaver removed from the monitor from the close it the suction has a tip which is inflow and outflow keep under the tap of the warm water saline once you finish that keep inside the soap water solution for 5 minutes
as ortho supervision i keep my instruments with my myself so i clean myself so it's very important to clean your suctions clean important the shaver system so that it will not have a blockage and very, and decrease the chance of infection after each surgery so that's what i want to have a small video on the how to clean your shavers so thank you thank you panelist So see your voice. Okay, unmute. So see. Somehow unmute all is not work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Hari. It's a wonderful presentation. Um, to be frank, basics of arthroscopy is a very vast topic. It's something that can never end. Okay, but uh, somehow you have managed to cover almost everything. You talked about the types of arthroscope, that is uh, 30 degree that we normally use. And uh, we have 45 degree scope and 70 degree scope. You talked about uh, the benefits and limitations of each of them, the connections that go with the scope, the pump pressure, what is recommended and what is safe and what is good for the visualization, the fluids that, can, that should be used, especially with pottery. And we have the option of using normal saline with uh, radio frequency. You discussed about the position of the patient that is in a knee arthroscopy and also in the shoulder arthroscopy. With respect to the rest of the things, the armamentarium for the knee arthroscopy and shoulder arthroscopy are vastly different. You have covered almost all of them. You did talk about uh, the ACL set and the PCL set, strippers for uh, harvesting the graft. You have closed stripper and open stripper. You talked about the implants. There's the screws and also the anchors and interference screws, especially. And you have the category. There, there is the bio screw. You have the HA coated PLLA and regular PLLA and also the peak. That's the plastic one. And then we have the meniscal repair implants. And with respect to the shoulder, the instrumentation is vast actually the visinger rod is a very important instrument and the probe is very important in both knee arthroscopy and shoulder arthroscopy you have the cannula you have eight mm cannula and six mm cannula each has its own benefits and limitations then you have the lasso the bird beak and the scorpion the regular one and the self-retrieving one uh, you also talked about the suture anchors and how the, um, the knotless ones work and the knotted ones work also Okay, and finally, the perk of the program was the arthroscopic knot, knotting technique, and which you demonstrated very beautifully, and your um, the cleaning, the last video of the cleaning the arthroscope. Thank you very much. It was a very vast technique. So, um, I asked the panel, I have a couple of questions. I asked the panel, has anyone had the experience of uh, using underwater cautery, not the radio frequency, underwater cautery? And uh, did you have to use the scene for your surgery? Instead of normal saline or um, ringer lactate? Dr. Yashwan. Hello? Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Yashwan. Sasi, am I audible? Yeah, you are clear. Okay. Good evening, Menon, sir. Good evening, Menon, sir. Good evening, seniors, panelists, uh, speakers. You. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm doing fine, sir. Uh, uh, Sasi, I, I didn't get your question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ashwin, have you used underwater cautery instead of radio frequency for any of your surgeries? And did you have to change the fluid? Like uh, you had to use glycine instead of uh, RL or saline? Uh, Sissy, I never used uh, 
any irrigation fluid apart from saline i don't have any experience we don't use here uh, both uh, for uh, any uh, uh, this thing scopic surgeries or lab, uh, urology also they don't use uh, any other uh, fluid other than saline so with respect to radio frequency wand i regularly use arthro care uh, wand and uh, uh, if it is not there i use a uh, tablet from arthrex yeah professor patra sir uh, what is your opinion yeah ha uh, hello yeah sir yeah i am audible yes sir yes sir clear. yeah yeah i am uh, i am also have no experience of uh, using glycine and all that so i think uh, yes. our surgery is uh, limited surgery is uh, never required any cautery so much to use but nowadays all the soft tissues are repairs and all that require a lot of cautery i think and uh, yeah you have to radio frequency is a better choice yeah to be frank uh, i have used uh, underwater cautery during the uh, early stages or uh, in the what do you say the um, peripheral hospitals where i did surgeries where uh, radio frequency is a uh, is a privilege i have still used muscleline but uh, fortunately i have not got into any issues professor pandey give me your inputs is it uh, harmful is normal saline with under cotter do you have an experience with it so um in my practice i very rarely use underwater cautery radio frequencies i mean if you are going to do arthroscopic surgery i think one of the most important advice i will give you is if you are going to do arthroscopic surgery have everything with you don't go and do something uh, with half instruments missing or half the things not there uh, remember there is a patient in front of you and you want to do the best for your patient so have everything available and then only start doing your arthroscopy as far as underwater cautery is concerned i mean i i have radio frequency so i very rarely need the I mean, I need underwater cautery because I can burn anything I want with the radio frequency very well. And most arthroscopic surgeons will use radio frequency now. The problem with glycine is it's not a, a, a there is a theoretical risk. It's it's a very theoretical risk. It may cause cerebral edema uh, if you are using a lot of glycine. And and if you are starting off initially doing arthroscopy, especially shoulder arthroscopy, I have seen people use seven eight liters. of fluid without any trouble and if you got glycine there there is a theoretical risk of cerebral edema which you don't want to do i mean these arthroscopic surgeries are on very fit patients so you want to minimize the risk you don't want to have anything which can lead to any problems so i will avoid glycine if at all possible and if you don't have uh, radio free frequency then i think you should really look at whether you should be doing arthroscopic surgery of Uh, of any sort of complicate comp complex complexity yeah that's a point that is very important in arthroscopy can look easy mm -hmm. but uh, once you are inside especially the complex surgeries especially with the shoulder it is very much important that you have all your instruments and implants and expertise assistance with you because you can land up in some seemingly small trouble that can take you forever to rectify so it is very important to make sure that uh, you need to have all your instruments with you uh, professor jagdish menon uh, what position of the knee do you prefer in your acl reconstruction well, uh, first of all i commend uh, dr hari krishna very crisp talk Uh, i liked it uh, it was very basic the instrumentations and uh, techniques and also a little bit on maintenance of uh, equipment which is so critical for success uh, whatever little um, acls have done most of them are with the leg hanging off the table so with me sitting and uh, that was the position uh, most commonly adopted by me for the acl okay wonderful there are uh, there, there are a couple of uh, positions 
that can be used and uh, hanging the knee definitely hanging the leg definitely has a lot of advantages especially with uh, the gravity acting on the leg especially when you want to do something with the meniscus especially a repair you can get to go into the posterior aspect without much difficulties but uh, for the learners who are listening to the program it is very important to make sure before you start with your incision that you make sure you can manipulate the limb in to all positions that are needed especially for example on the lateral meniscus you need to do something make sure you can do a figure of four or as a menial meniscus you need to assess or operate make sure you can give sufficient vagus and you have a sufficient lateral support counter in order to give the vagus or if you are not comfortable doing it yourself make sure you have a good assistant who can help you through the through the work it is very important but shrinivas you want to ask something yeah that was, uh, that was a very good talk uh, uh, hari thank you very much it's uh, and i agree it's a huge topic and you have covered most of the things um, uh, just a, a couple of things i wanted to mention actually uh, regarding shavers uh, there are basically three types of shavers one uh, as you said there is an inner tube outer tube inner tube there is one type where there is a smooth inner tube and smooth outer and there is a, a serrated inner and a, and a smooth outer serrated inner and a serrated outer the difference is um, as you go more serrated it's more aggressive and uh, it's usually done in the oscillation mode uh, whereas the burrs are used in the forward mode and the speed usual speed for these shavers is about 2000 rpm or the burrs is about 5000 rpm i think burrs are always used in the forward mode so um, uh, you covered most of them uh, anchors the, the types of anchors also uh, you know the metal metal anchors uh, you told about uh, bioabsorbable anchors biocomposite anchors biocomposite are uh, um, uh, hydroxyapatite coated and uh, uh, you know screw type of anchors the impaction type of anchors um, and there, there are toggling type of anchors some expanding anchors i don't have much experience with the expanding anchors uh, maybe uh, our senior uh, uh, seniors have experience with those um, uh, mr deepan menon do you uh, have any tips on uh, the arthroscopy for beginners i think the important thing is uh, positioning very important uh, make sure that you do it in a position for Uh, in a good position for various reasons one is for your own personal health you don't want to be uh, sort of uh, straining your back and other things doing arthroscopic surgery so you need to make sure you're comfortable yourself as a surgeon and you then uh, need to be able to manipulate the knee obviously when you examine a knee under anesthetic before you commence arthroscopy you know exactly what that knee is uh, Uh, you know what sort of movement range you've got in the knee and what sort of way you can manipulate the knee in whatever positions you need to for the arthroscopy portal placement is very very important if you place your portal uh, in portals in the wrong position it can really create a lot of difficulty and that is where this uh, technique which uh, uh, was mentioned uh, very nicely about using a <coughs> spinal needle you know to first determine whether you can reach the structure which you want to be dealing with and then once you know that you can reach that structure you then make your incision there of course uh, i don't do shoulder surgery i do mainly knee surgery but you have to obviously think also of any vital anatomical structure that is in that area so you don't want to be uh, damaging something because this is uh, these portals are made blind the portals should be made big enough so that you can manipulate your instruments quite easily but not too much that fluid keeps leaking out so you got to get that correct size of the portals that's very very important and familiarity with the kit with any operation i think if you're familiar with your kit and you do it regularly then you find it much easier if you're using new kit probably better to have a rep around who will be able to sort of guide you on that and tell you you know what are the intricacies of obviously read and there's so much of information now available on you know the videos and a uh, youtube thing so if you want to do anything new technique you would probably be looking at seeing a video first you then 
probably attend a course in that, learn the technique properly, and then only do it. So it's that's one of the ways of keeping your, uh, you know, your skills of learning and your uh, CME all that up to date. So I think essentially, uh, most important thing is portals. I generally don't tend to use a sharp broker because uh, I always use a blunt one because many a time I give my uh, the diagnostic arthroscopy to my registrar to do. And uh, if you push the, these sharp trockers into the knee, you can cause damage to the cartilage and all that. So I think if you, I tend to always use a blunt uh, trocker. But I think overall that was a lot of, in, uh, you know, that was a talk which was well presented. But there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, sort of area to cover, which I think uh, you, it's difficult to do justice in, you know, 30, 40 minutes. But uh, well, it was a good uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Can I just uh, just make a couple of points? Yes, please. One of the, I think uh, in an institute like Jipmer, I'm sure you, you guys should get one of these simulators. I don't know whether Jagdish, you have a simulator in your... In yeah, your yeah, we do. We do. Right? we do have. We yeah. do have, yes. So that's an, an excellent... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is an excellent way of learn. I mean, people who are in you know, first year or second year, there's a very good way to learn triangulization of the, especially shoulders and and knees. Uh, knees, not so much, but shoulder is absolutely important that you do that. Uh, uh, and, you know, th there are people here who do it for general surgery and make you peel an orange inside, uh, inside the tummy. And those are good skills to, uh, a good way to learn. Uh, yeah. The, sec the other thing I want to talk about was the pressure, you know, the fluid pressure. And one of the things uh, Hari was saying that in shoulder, you could start, uh, you could have uh, optimal would be 60 to 70 pressure. Uh, I would beg to differ slightly. I generally start with low pressure, as low as possible. And different people are different. <laughs> you have a very large lady with... With, and when you're going to be struggling, maybe you can go with a slightly higher pressure. With a nice thin person with nice thin shoulders, you can start with low pressure. So I would start with even 30 and then see how it's going. If it's going fine, you carry on with 30 because the higher the pressure, the more tissue, the fluid you are pushing inside the body, inside the soft tissue. And I've seen people running it at 80 and the the fluid is going very fast and a lot of fluid gets, and it's not that, it's not common, but I think uh, you can cause compartment syndromes or some other sort of nasty things by pushing in a lot of fluid. So I would go with low, uh, and I don't know, Dipin, what you say, do you use uh, uh, a fluid uh, pressurizer in knees at all? Yes, I do. For my ACLs, I do. And uh, like, like yourself, I... I tend to use a low pressure first. And if I find that the visibility is poor, then I just ask them to gradually increase the pressure till I'm able to see. The other thing that I tend to use is, um, I tend to use uh, the scope initially uh, for the first part of my ACL reconstruction. Uh, so which means the diagnostic bit, the initial chondral and the meniscal surgery, I tend to use uh, a, a tourniquet and I tend to use pressure irrigation. Once I've harvested the graft, I tell the uh, an acetist to usually give tranexamic acid, release the tourniquet. And um, so that reduces the tourniquet time. And then I adjust the pressure, as you say, starting from a small, uh, lower pressure, say 30, 40, something like that, right up to about 50, maybe 60 some occasionally. But you try and obviously adjust other things as much as possible. But if you can avoid putting it under high pressure, it's very helpful. It reduces soft tissue edema, all these kinds of things post-surgery. And it improves rehab as well. You can quick, I mean, if you have a less swollen joint, you can get things moving uh, quicker. Patient has got less discomfort at the end of the procedure. So when you're looking at trying to discharge patients the same day or the next morning, uh, you want to have a, a knee which is not too swollen and too painful. I agree. I would completely agree with what you're saying. Start low, go higher when needed. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Dr. Dipin, I think when... Nerve injury is not uncommon, especially in certain, especially in shoulders. I do a lot of elbow arthroscopies and there's a huge risk to the nerves around the elbow. Thankfully, around the knee, you very rarely go at the back. 
uh, but in elbows one has to be very careful you make your portals very carefully and you make the skin incision with a knife spread it with a artery clip go right down to bone and then gradually go inside because the risk of nerve damage if you're doing elbow arthroscopy it's uh, well over 10% which is quite high yeah, yeah. They, they, they advise not to use suction in elbow arthroscopy as well so yeah <laughs> i'm sorry i just brought that i know a couple of tips for elbow arthroscopy uh, you know, for uh, uh, private uh, practitioners, new those who are starting new on arthroscopy, I think you should know um, about your equipment. Um, you should know about your camera, your camera console, your shaver, your settings in the shaver, uh, your light source, how what the connections, where they go, how you record it. Because uh, if you are in the private setup, um, the, the people helping in the uh, theaters. Uh, may not know or they might take leave so you, you are alone managing yourself with the uh, setup so you should familiarize yourself with the with the setup uh, how to operate it and uh, how to troubleshoot is very important uh, you have uh, suddenly if the monitor doesn't work you should know how to get the picture that's the most common thing i have seen uh, working in the private setup i carry my um, equipment to occasionally to other place so uh, you should uh, you have to check the monitor the system before you start the case if you uh, tend to carry your equipment the other thing about L shoulder arthroscopy the way i learned if i was doing say when i started doing rotator cuff repairs in my earlier days you uh, do some arthroscopically you enter the shoulder, look at the rotator cuff, see everything, and then you can open the shoulder and do an open, really, open uh, repair. There is no shame in go converting an arthroscopic to an open procedure if you are struggling. In the first few occasions, I did the arthroscopy, looked around, looked everything, mobilized the cuff, prepared the footprint, and then I did a mini open, I repaired it. So next time I did a bit more arthroscopically, the third time I did a bit more arthroscopic, and then I did an all arthroscopic cuff repair. Similarly, you can do it for an anterior stabilization. Uh, I, I don't know if knee, you can do the same. Knee, especially ACL, you probably do all arthroscopic now. But initially, when you are doing, you can do bits and pieces open and bits and pieces arthroscopically, and there is no harm in that. If you were, if you, if you are struggling to do it all arthroscopic. Okay. I think those are very, very valid points. As uh, Professor Pandey, Professor Deepin, and Dr. Srinivas put it down, simulation is a very, very important part of, especially the shoulder arthroscopy learning. It is also very useful in knee arthroscopy learning. When uh, I did my fellowship in Singapore, it was the simulator in which I trained most of my shoulder initial arthroscopy. And subsequently, you gain a lot of confidence in putting the scope inside and man triangulating inside the shoulder. And somehow I landed up with the shoulder first rather than the knee. And once your confidence with the shoulder, you automatically tend to do very well in the knee, but that might not be exactly a great option for a lot of people. Uh, it's usually said a knee arthroscopy would be the first step before a shoulder arthroscopy. It goes many ways for many people. And uh, regarding the fluid pressure, it is also very important, especially in extra articular surgeries, especially in a shoulder or uh, sometimes in small joints like the elbow, it is very, very important to keep a tab on the amount of pressure that you are putting into the knee because there can be a lot of fluid extravasation and the whole anatomy of the region can change and you can land up in uh, manipulating and uh, struggling around the joint before you can do your procedure. And uh, a very, very important point uh, Professor Pandey has pointed out is don't shy away from opening up the joint. Especially, you should have, you should know more knowledge about how to do a mini open rotator cuff repair, especially in your early days or uh, patellar split reconstruction or some other plan B. 
if you are not experienced in your knee arthroscopy or shoulder arthroscopy that can encourage you to put in more scopes into the joint for your learning at the knee or in the shoulder and then you can improve on yourself if you did not have the privilege of having a proper fellowship the final the best option is to have a good fellowship a good trainer good teacher who can point out the mistakes that you do but if that is not an option if you are in a peripheral location this could be a very very good option for you the arthrex has a arthro box which is very simple manly and you can take it in suitcase a manual a simulator it's very yeah, easy yeah to... there are yeah so arthro box. there are yeah most of the simulators are very expensive they are good but they are very expensive but there are a lot of modifications of uh, uh, simulation that have come up they are very cheap like arthrex like arthrobox like uh, dr harish hari krishna is saying and there are other lot of uh, locally um, juga locally modified type of um, simulator that have come up you can find out what is best for you or you can have some type of tie up with a simulator um, simulation um, of fields which can exist in your place for example there is one in hyderabad there could be one in bangalore or so so you could find a center near you and you can have your training they do offer training for people everywhere possibly with some sort of a subscription or something don't underestimate simulation training it's very very useful and with respect to the canola i would like to make sorry uh, i would like to make a point dr hari krishna was saying that um, 8 mm canola is uh, mostly preferred i would like to differ in this especially with respect to the antero superior portal and the antero inferior portal especially when you want to do lot of instrumentation over there uh, it's very very good and you have lot of space in the rotator interval to put in an 8 mm canola but unfortunately when you go in the antero superior portal in the, the antero superior person doesn't like your talk <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> okay in the antero superior portal what happens your biceps tendon is very close to you or the anterior edge of the supraspinatus is very close to you so it sometimes may be better to use a 6.5 mm cannula rather than a 8 mm cannula um patra yeah, sir do you have uh, any tips that you can share with us uh uh no not much but i i, I want to uh, say for the beginners Uh, before you put your uh, twist your portals and put your scope inside how about distending the joint will it yep. help so i i usually for the shoulder i distend the joints for the before that yep. i put a spinal okay. needle and uh, yes 100 ml ns i i distend the joint then i'll put a scope definitely it will be a better visualization but and uh, i same thing where i agree with uh, dipen when he said that uh, sap prakar may damage the cartilage the bone so it's better when you use the knife in a distended joint go cut the capsule and then use this blunt uh, scope that is a prakar it will be more safe yeah i think this is a very important point you, as a beginner it's preferable that you distend the joint whether it is in the knee or in the shoulder doesn't matter especially in the elbow you will definitely have to do it um over time you won't feel like you have the necessity to distend the joint when you have get the tactical uh, feedback after your experience you will feel confident and you feel that uh, you're not damaging the joint anymore even without distension but for a beginner it's definitely something that you have to do and um, uh, professor pandey sir uh, when you put the anterior portal there is an antero inferior or antero superior portal do you like do you like to make an incision in capsule with your uh, blade or would you like to go with the stretching of the capsule with the wisinger rod and dilator so yeah the, you should not want to you don't want to put that blade so much deep inside i'll tell you uh, one instance of my registrar he put the uh, it was a knee fortunately it was a knee arthroscopy when he put the blade 
uh, inside the joint and he was watching it through arthroscope when he came out unfortunately only the handle came out the blade had slipped out of the handle and stayed inside the joint and the next one hour he spent trying to get that blade out so try not to put the whole blade inside the joint okay. especially in shoulder surgery you always just need the skin and then you use your troca which has got a troca that's why it's called a troca you can push it uh, through the capsule i would try and avoid uh, putting a blade inside the joint even the tip knee joint you can get away with but uh, i my one my one experience is that somebody put the whole blade inside and came out and the blade was left inside it was quite a stressful okay. one hour okay. okay i share similar opinions some way or other i have never been um, comfortable putting in a blade up to the capsule but i have heard experts saying that uh, when you dilate with a dilator you tend to stretch the capsule and there is a lot of leakage in from into the soft tissue but somehow or other i have never had the tendency to put my blade there is i mean um, i never in the knee but even in the shoulder i have not had the tendency to put the blade in until the capsule so the technique could be different just make sure that you don't damage anything and uh, everything you do and your viewing portal has to be done under visualization there has been an experience when i was in my early uh, fellowship observership program somewhere in south india uh, there was one of the fellows the surgeon he was doing the anterior inferior portal uh, i got the anterior superior portal so he went in with a blade and unfortunately there was a partial rupture partial cut of the biceps tendon so they had to do something about it so this is something you have to be very careful when you are going with the instrumentation portal dr yashwan do you like to share something there was a comment about uh, uh, nanoscope um, does anyone have experience with the nanoscope arthrex nanoscope used for outpatient um, knee arthroscopy hello sasi yeah uh, once one second uh, professor pandey and professor dipen do you have experience with nanoscope i certainly don't know i don't i don't have experience i don't know about uh, mr pandey no i i i don't think it's caught on very much in uk Uh, this is something which is more of an american baby where they thought they could just put do a diagnostic arthroscopy uh, uh, in the outpatients my my problem is that there should never be a diagnostic arthroscopy you don't do a diagnostic arthroscopy uh, every arthroscopy should be therapeutic you should go in the inside to do something Uh, diagnostic arthroscopy of the knee especially if you do a good clinical examination and get an mri scan almost most things can be picked up i don't see why putting a scope in an outpatient is going to add to whatever you can get from a clinical examination history and an mri scan i totally agree uh, with the availability of very good mri techniques 1.5 tesla 3 tesla and they talk about 7 tesla which is still in experimental stage i get the role of uh, diagnostic arthroscopy is almost disappearing i totally agree with that dr yashwan uh, uh, sasi am i audible yeah you are clear uh, sasi with respect to making portals antero inferior antero superior portals i completely agree uh, uh, in order to uh, not to injure the important structure it is always better this thing my sequence somehow it is first i uh, introduce an epidural needle i see inside that will allow me the this thing proper angle of entry i usually make a uh, small incision i go through the caps and uh, into the rotator interval and make a small leg then i come in with a wisinger so exactly that is the point because if you go with a blunt instrument like wisinger rod and uh, create a portal uh, it will cause lot of uh, fluid leakage and uh, probably uh, associated problems 
as you said definitely uh, it's a hell of a situation breaking a scalpel knife inside a shoulder joint knee joint at least to some extent uh, we can manage but shoulder uh, it's a, it's a very messy this thing uh, i also have uh, one or two experience it's a tough this thing always better to uh, do a blunt en entry and uh, put a cannula probably put a 8.25 cannula inferiorly and put a 6 mm uh, superiorly so that uh, that uh, toggle and space to work is better J just a quick comment about the needle uh, arthroscopy I, have, i think india in, in india nobody does that whatever i have studied about it it is mainly used as a, uh, a di diagnostic arthroscopy to see the meniscal repairs especially in the opd basis it's a disposable arthroscope small needle arthroscopes so just do a small uh, this thing uh, nick put a scope inside see uh, mainly used for uh, meniscal repairs healing of the meniscal repair or any other such as which you are reconstruct that's what i know okay not seeing us do you have any other questions uh, not really uh -huh. yeah i think that was a wonderful session we had a lot of discussion dr hari did a wonderful job in explaining almost every part of basic arthroscopy but uh, it is yeah uh, dr yashwant again uh, uh, sasinder can we come back uh, probably once in a month or once in two months with uh, difficult cases not only arthroscopy any other case and uh, discuss with uh, in this forum with the uh, seniors like Uh, patru sir uh, menan sir yes. pandey sir menan sir and uh, srinivas sir uh, not only arthroscopy will make it general this thing interesting topics it will be a very um, rather than learning it's a nostalgic at this thing so i i yeah. suggest that yeah so, wonderful uh, you are going to do that probably. one one final question hari can you tell yes, me sir. the types of sutures used in arthroscopy But that's PDS and fibers. There is actually the slides were there. I cut shorted it. There are fiber wires. Okay. But sir, that but I told that braided switches versus monofilament. Definitely braided switches have an advantage for the knot security. I thank Dr. Sashinder sir for giving an opportunity. It is a very good topic to for the beginners. I felt, and I also learned so many things with this talk. yeah wonderful wonderful it was our pleasure learning a lot and it was a lot of recap and thank you dr professor patro professor pandey and professor dipen for uh, being available thank you dr yashwan and i guess thank you professor sir thank Dishman, you everyone sir jagdish pandey had to leave due to an emergency thank you, thank you very much it was a wonderful program thank you dr shrinivas thank you very much sir thank you everyone thank you dr patro nice to see you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you sir pande <laughs> thank you sir shivan <laughs> thank you sir thank you, thank you. right oh, right oh, thank you <laughs>